Okay, so hello and welcome to everyone to the CLTS Knowledge Hub webinar on the use of CLTS in peri-urban and urban environments. Uh, for those who weren't here earlier, I'm Petra from the CLTS Knowledge Hub. Um, we're based at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK and we engage in a variety of activities to find out about the underground realities of CLTS practice and we work with all who are interested and engaged in CLTS so we can learn about and share and promote good practice, ideas and innovations. Uh, as you may know, we run the CLTS website and we send out the CLTS newsletter. We convene sharing and learning workshops on CLTS, normally at the big conferences. And we produce a variety of publications such as the Frontiers of CLTS series and our recently published book on sustainability. So while CLTS has been predominantly used in rural settings, and that's what it's really known for, in the last five or six years, there's been much discussion and also some exploration of how it could be used in an urban or peri-urban setting. So my colleague Jamie Myers, who will present today, has been engaged in quite a bit of research into the topic and has written extensively on it. And today he'll present what we know so far on this subject. He'll present for about 30 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions and answers. And you can ask your questions using the box that you'll see there. You just type your question in the box and we will see them and then I will read them out to Jamie and ask, them to ask him to answer those. Uh, we'll also record the webinar so you can listen to it again afterwards and you can share it with your colleagues and networks. And there'll be some space on the website for further discussion related to the topic and we'll also point you in the direction of more information and further reading. So without further ado, I'll pass you over to Jamie. Thank you very much, Petra. So welcome to this webinar on using a CLTS approach in peri-urban and urban areas. As Petra said, my name is Jamie Myers and I'm a research officer based at the Institute of Development Studies and work on the CLTS Knowledge Hub. So I will start with a very brief overview of the hub and the peri-urban and urban work we have been engaging in. So to date, we've been creating a database of urban CLTS projects across the world. We've documented its use in peri-urban and urban areas for Plan International Netherlands Pan-Africa program. We've produced two global summaries on common themes and trends, which were presented at the last two WEDEC conferences. In August, oh, sorry, not in August, in June this year, we convened a three-day workshop in Addis Ababa, where we brought together those involved in urban CLTS programs across the world at the workshop, we agreed upon a number, of, a number of principles and steps I will discuss later. The outcomes of the workshop are a learning brief focusing on the potential for scale and a more detailed learning paper which goes into the details on the principles and appropriate steps necessary for a CLTS approach to be used in more urbanized environments. Both of these are available on our website. So, Unimproved basic and dirty latrines, open defecation and the unsafe, unhygienic management of feces pose a serious risk to human health in towns and cities across the world. Although rural populations have a much higher proportion of people relying on unimproved sanitation, high population densities, socio-economic inequalities and the painfully slow rates of access to safely managed sanitation services will increase the urgency of the challenge in urban areas. <clears throat> a lack of sanitation and water, water services is a dimension of poverty. Satterthwaite and Mitlin, based at the International Institute of Environment and Development, have written that urban poverty will only be significantly reduced if those living in poverty are able to influence decision makers and are given the space to design and implement their own initiatives. As we all know, community-led total sanitation encourages those living in poverty to decide together how to create a clean and hygienic environment, 
and take a leading role in making their communities open defecation free. It has proven to be effective in tackling challenges in rural areas and there are a growing number of examples of its use in peri-urban and urban areas across Africa and Asia. However, there are a number of challenges we find in urban areas which make a copy-paste model of rural practice difficult. These are not limited to that can include institutional factors such as a greater number of actors across the sanitation chain who are often uncoordinated, a tendency towards top-down infrastructure focused programming. There is often a lack of political will to support the poorest. There is little to no guidance, protocols or procedures for an urban CLTS approach like we see for rural CLTS. Furthermore, citywide sanitation plans often do not incorporate community-based initiatives into the mix. At the community level, there are a number of, there are often heterogeneous and trans, sorry, at the community level, communities are often heterogeneous and transient in nature. People are often busy and busy at different times. Defining a community is difficult. Space constraints and high population density make constructing individual household latrines problematic. In addition, low incomes and the high price of appropriate technologies that pass city guidelines can make these technologies unobtainable for the urban poor. Insecure land tenure and informal settlements create additional challenges. Despite these challenges, there are a growing number of examples of CLTS-like approaches which have been used. There's a list of countries here where we found it being used. I'll mention some of these quickly. UNICEF have used CLTS in small towns in Eritrea. Both Ethiopia and World Vision have used a CLTS approach in small and medium-sized towns across Ethiopia. This photo was taken in Hawassa in Ethiopia and the shops have been built on a former open defecation site. Plan Kenya have used CLTS in Mathari 10, a slum in the middle of Nairobi. It has also been used in Kenya by Practical Action in Nakuru who are planning on using a similar model in Kasumu. Seed Madagascar have adapted CLTS in Fort Dauphin in the south of the country. UNICEF used CLTS in small towns in Mauritania and have used it in, Mo in, sorry, have used it in Mozambique on the outskirts of rural towns as part of a citywide sanitation strategy. Practical Action have used it in Galaraya, a town of 60,000 people in Nepal. Tanzania last month released guidelines for urban CLTS and in Zambia waste used CLTS triggering to create demand for urine diversion dry toilets in Savonga and Kavwe. These cases highlight the range of rural towns, inner city slums and peri-urban areas and a range of different organizations involved. So we initially drew on these case studies and began to identify a number of key lessons. The first was the approach differs across the different projects. It has been used to a various degree of success, so varying degrees of success. The context differs between cities across and within countries and within a city or town the context between different neighborhoods can also be different. The context should be expected to change throughout the life of a project or program. The urban sanitation and hygiene challenge is more than the traditional rural approach can bear. There is a need to work with a variety of different stakeholders along the sanitation chain. However, wide stakeholder involvement often makes it more challenging to manage. And finally, shit enters communities. It isn't just produced there. Targeted interventions may make communities open defecation free but not break fecal oral pathways. For example, in Savonga, Zambia, in a poor neighborhood where CLTS triggering is being used, households rely on Lake Kariba for drinking. However, sewage is entering the lake from nearby government institutions and hotels. When visiting Lalibela, a tourist town in northern Ethiopia, where a CLTS approach was used, we were told that many hotels had sewage being released untreated into the environment. 
So, as I mentioned earlier, the Hub, with the support of Plan Ethiopia, hosted a workshop on the potential of using a CLTS approach in peri-urban and urban areas in June. We brought together those with experience of implementing urban CLTS alongside some urban sanitation experts. So, during the workshop, we looked across the different projects and saw that the unifying factor were not particular tools or methods, but a number of principles that also underscore rural practice. These include commitment to participation and empowerment. Community members are at the heart of the process and drive the agenda, making their own decisions and being encouraged to take their own actions where possible. Collective behaviour change and collective action requires the process to focus on all. Everyone must change unsafe sanitation practices in order for the risk of faecal contamination to be reduced. The quality of sanitation services cannot be judged on an individual household basis. It is a collective problem. If one household has an improved toilet, they still run the risk of faecal contamination if a few continue to, open, to practice open defecation or continue to practice unsafe faecal sludge management. A community-led process cannot deliver all pressing wash needs across the sanitation chain in urban areas. However, community ownership is important. This can come about directly through communities taking their own actions, but can also be built symbolically through high levels of community buy-in and involving all stakeholders in decision-making processes. Demand creation includes triggering, a set of tools used to evoke powerful emotions and confront the negative impacts of open defecation and poor sanitation. It cannot be relied upon alone and will almost always need to be integrated into a much wider behaviour change communication campaign, which in turn is part of a city or town-wide sanitation strategy tackling challenges across the chain. In a CLTS process, natural leaders who are committed, who are community-based activists and champions, emerge throughout the process and can help lead and support subsequent activities. And then finally, linked to the need for collective action, an ODF environment is an objective. It is not the only objective, However, any CLTS intervention, whether in an urban or rural environment, is not considered a success unless all have appropriate sanitation facilities that are used and use is sustained over time. So reflecting on the initial lessons and the principles and accepting that the context will look different in different places, there are a number of steps that we have identified as important. I will now go through them and provide some practical examples of how these have been done in different projects. So firstly, there is a need for a situational and stakeholder analysis. Owing to the greater complexity in urban areas, gaining a thorough understanding of the context and identifying the range of relevant stakeholders is critical. Any further activities, including triggering and follow-up, should be designed based on findings from these analyses. As we can assume the context is likely to change throughout a project, a learning component should be integrated with other activities. Information to look for include obvious things such as existing latrine coverage, usage, maintenance and other practices related to hygiene, land ownership, plot layout and tenancy agreements, socio-economic disease and cultural data. However, also ship flows throughout a city to make sure shit is an entering from other communities and make sure we're not asking the poorest residents to invest time or money and still remain exposed to faecal contamination. A community-led process cannot deliver all aspects of water and sanitation needs without external support. Therefore, the range and roles of other water and sanitation actors must be understood early on in the process in order that they can be integrated into the pre-triggering, triggering and post-triggering stages. A stakeholder analysis can help CLTS facilitators to identify these different actors and institutions, their roles and responsibilities. 
in Nakuru, Kenya, practical action, mapped existing institutions and local partners through surveys with key stakeholders, including various ministries, active NGOs and private operators. They then compiled a list of actors outlining the, out outlining the activities each of them were currently doing. In Mathare, Nairobi, Plan Kenya organized a stakeholder event with around 100 people from the government, representatives of different geographical areas, community-based service providers, NGOs, local businesses, youth groups, women's groups, churches, etc. The participants looked at their own role in sanitation, their strengths and weaknesses, the resources they already had at their disposal, and their relationship with other groups. The facilitators asked people what they saw as their role in the proposed initiative. This gave them a basis on which to agree a proposal for activities going forward. So number two is stakeholder engagement. Partnerships and relationships with multiple stakeholders are essential. It is important to get strategic players to understand the principles, aims and methodology and to support and complement implementation. It will involve building and maintaining relationships between relevant actors. This has been done in past urban CLTS projects in a number of ways, including training sessions, interagency visits, community exposure visits, and showcasing of global CLTS successes. Institutional triggering used to trigger governments, service providers, and the private sector can be used to mobilize action among duty bearers and change mindsets of urban sanitation professionals. Thirdly, there is triggering, which has to compete with other interests and is unlikely to reach all community members. Consequently, events need to be fast, exciting and enticing, and multi -trigger, multi, multiple triggering events may be needed. Triggering units need to be identified. The particular tools need to be designed based on the practicalities of a given area. A good enough situational and stakeholder analysis can help design an appropriate triggering, such as identifying triggering units and potential champions or leaders to involve in the process. Examples of triggering include in Nala, in Nepal, where data about the extent of water contamination at each of the key water sources around the community was posted up on signboards, which shocked and motivated participants. In Nakuru, Kenya, they found it extremely hard to gather a crowd and keep them interested in the triggering. So a theatre group was brought along to perform comedy sketches about sanitation at the start of the event and in between each triggering tool to encourage people to stay engaged. In Rosso, Mauritania, triggering was done by neighbourhood as well as by homogenous groups such as market merchants, fishermen, livestock salesmen and religious school students. Triggering at different sites was conducted almost simultaneously and the city was treated as an overall unit with competitions between areas encouraged. In Hoasa, Ethiopia, in order to reach more people, an additional triggering took place at the level of the compound or plot consisting of around 5 to 20 households. Each compound was brought together. They visited filthy shared toilets rather than open defecation sites. Mass media has also been used in many cases. In Mauritania, journalists, radio stations and the mayor through speeches, megaphone vans and preachers at mosques all helped spread the word about the harm of open defecation. One more important thing to note is triggering will often not lead to households constructing toilets but can unify demand and help to identify champions and activists who can mobilize urban communities to demand their rights to sanitation. Then comes post-triggering follow-up, which is about maintaining momentum and getting people engaged in building, fixing, cleaning and maintaining toilets. Efforts to ensure community engagement and action after a triggering event are likely to be more complicated and take much longer. Competing demands also make this stage critical in building and maintaining momentum. Examples of practice include World Vision in Ethiopia, who used exchange visits between communities to encourage and celebrate progress. Each community would elect a seven-member sanitation task force. Periodically, exchange visits would be organized between areas 
during which the seven members between them visited all households and assessed the toilets using an agreed checklist. Finally, all those communities would come together, compare the ranking, and celebrate those that were best. There's also technological options and solutions. Simple pitadrines will not be suitable in most urban areas and a range of appropriate solutions for a given context should be explored. Considerations needed when assessing options should include technological justice, promoting technologies everyone can access and that are socially and culturally acceptable. Catalogues of technolo technology options can help people make informed choices according to income level. Participatory design workshops with communities and municipal technical staff can be awaited lower costs and help ensure low-cost solutions are signed off by municipalities. Participatory technology design workshops were successful in the Curry, bringing together communities and the authorities. The workshops are integral in getting safe but low-cost designs approved. There's then facilitating supply. Products may not be available in local markets or costs may be too high. Programs should enable access to appropriate and affordable sanitation products and services. Barriers faced could include affordability, high regulatory standards unobtainable for the urban poor, or a lack of skilled labour. Facilitating support can involve getting appropriate models to market, developing and leveraging financing options, or working with municipalities to agree to pro-poor safe designs. There's also the safe management of faecal sludge. Population density and a lack of space requires a focus not just on containment, but also on ensuring safe management across the sanitation chain. There are some circumstances where FSM services can be community planned and managed. However, responsibility should not be placed entirely on community members. Planning and assessing service options should still involve all relevant, relevant stakeholders and can help build symbolic ownership. And any system should promote total access to emptying services rather than having a system only few can afford or a few use. UNICEF and Mauritania Practical Action in the Crew have provided training and equipment for FSM workers, something that is seen in other non-CLTS programs in towns and cities across the developing world. Safe FSM is extremely difficult to get right and one the sector is currently grappling with. With a CLTS lens, what a CLTS lens can bring is working to ensure total FSM coverage within a given area. Sorry, there was also, uh, there was also beyond ODF and wider service provision is about considering other sanitation and hygiene related services like solid and liquid waste management being important for gaining and maintaining a clean and hygienic environment. I'll go on to monitoring, verification and certification. Because community units are harder to identify, and as I've said, should enter communities through a number of different ways, what should be monitored is less obvious and difficult to standardise. Furthermore, as getting to ODF in urban areas is extremely challenging, celebrating small steps along the way could help maintain momentum. In Madagascar, community members agreed a set of criteria for rating toilets on maintenance, cleanliness, hand washing, availability of soap, etc. Each month, a group of health volunteers would walk around the community and rank every latrine. Neighbours were also given the opportunity to rate each other's latrine over three months, with results presented on a whiteboard situated in a communal place. Those families which have maintained high standards over three months are presented with a small incentive in a presentation ceremony encouraging positive behaviour change. So, what is the potential for a CLTS approach? Our work is beginning to show that CLTS in, urban, in the urban context can support the aim of safely managed sanitation provided it is designed and adjusted to the local context. It is one, it is a component embedded into a larger town or city-wide sanitation plan, and it is agreed upon by all relevant stakeholders. 
certain initiatives have managed to demonstrate scale. In Rosso, Mauritania, 32,000 people are now living in an ODF town, thanks to a UNICEF program. In Nakuru, Kenya, the Practical Action Project has reached 190,000 people. And in Galaria, Nepal, a town of 30,000 people became open defecation free in just six months. It is also beginning to gain government support. As I mentioned earlier, in Tanzania, the Ministry of Health, Community, Development, Gender, Elderly and Children have recently released national guidelines for urban CLTS to assist urban local authorities. The Indonesian government, through the IU WASH program, has produced a guide to urban sanitation, including CLTS tools. And the Ministry of Urban Development in India recently co-convened a workshop on citizen participation in the Urban Swatch Bharat mission, which we were invited to contribute to. So moving forward, what are the appropriate steps? Urban CLTS will take a different form depending on the context. Principles should be further refined in order to demonstrate how it differs from rural practice and other urban sanitation approaches. The development of a more coherent protocol and toolkit would be an appropriate next step. Continuing to build a body of evidence from different urban contexts, peri-urban, small and medium-sized towns, large cities, informal settlements and slums, documentation of its use failures and successes can help inform future practice. As this approach is a departure from the traditional urban sanitation programs, capacity development will be needed for relevant stakeholders at different levels. This will include municipalities, line managers, utility companies, NGOs and community members. Those facilitating the process will need a different set of skills from those who work on rural CLTS. Urban CLTS must be incorporated into municipal sanitation strategies and master plans. It is not a complete solution to urban sanitation and should not be promoted externally to a city or town-wide plan. It will also be important to consider how it can be linked to wider issues in the urban environment, such as solid and liquid waste management and, as I've stressed throughout, FSM. The co-production of services encouraged in order to support a comprehensive approach to citywide coverage of sanitation as well as greater sustainability. Facilitators and communities should work with other sanitation actors across the sanitation chain. This is an argument which is explored further in an open access article which I wrote and it will be published in the next edition of Waterlines, so keep an eye out for that if you're interested. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, I'm a researcher and we like to make more work for ourselves. In this penultimate slide, I would like to pose some questions I believe to be important to be asking at this stage and some that should be kept in mind throughout an urban CLTS program. Firstly, why are we asking for community participation? It should not be pursued to remove responsibility from duty bearers, but is sought in order to find solutions both for facilities and services, people want, will maintain, and will use consistently over time. Are there more effective tools that complement the CLTS principles? How can we ensure municipalities and or local governments take a leading role? How to link CLTS activities into city townwide sanitation master plans? And we're still not there yet with how do we link with service provision? So, we are currently bouncing around ideas about how to move forward and we'd like to hear from you about what would benefit your work. Please do respond to these questions in the question box or via e our email addresses, which will be on the next slide, if you need more time to think about it. But we'd like to hear what resources you'd find useful. What should they contain? Are there resources already out there that we are not aware of? and whether you think the sector could benefit from a toolkit or guide on urban CLTS and what it could offer. So thanks very much. Please do write suggestions either in the box on your screen or email directly. Email them directly to me either at j.myers2 at ids.ac.uk 
or at the hub's email address, which is clts at ids.ac.uk. I'll now go back to the previous slide containing my questions while I answer any questions you might have for me. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, so please, if you have questions for Jamie, just type them in the box on your screen there. Uh, so far we've got one, um, which I think goes back to something that Jamie presented on earlier. The question is, please define what can be used as a community in the urban context. Is it a political community, ethnic, geographical, supply area? So maybe, Jamie, you could just go back to what you said earlier about the issue of community in urban settings. I think it will be very much dependent on your context. In some places where there's clear geographical divides, it might be worth considering that. In other areas, basing it on ethnic groups might be appropriate. However, if there's a particular if there's particular, if it's an area of particularly high conflict between ethnic groups, it wouldn't, it may not be appropriate if it's going to cause problems there. I, I, I think it's the most important thing is getting a thorough understanding at the beginning before you start triggering, and then basing your triggering units and the tools that you want to use around the information you collect through the initial analysis. So it's very context. I, I, I know I've probably said context in every single sentence during this presentation, but it is very context specific. Thanks, Jamie. I hope that answered your question, Richard. I'm still waiting for other questions to come in. So please, if even if you don't have a specific question, if you have more of a reflection or perhaps you've got some personal experience of working in urban settings with CLTS, you're also welcome to share that. Okay, so here we go, more stuff coming in. So we've got a, a question, I think, perhaps from Ethiopia. Uh, based on field experience, one of the challenges in urban, pre-urban sanitation, peri-urban I think, peri-urban sanitation is the issue of land deed. People are living in rented houses or not organized settlements. Construction of a sanitation facility is not only about community action. I think CLTS is not linear and straightforward in urban setting opposed to, opposed to rural settings. I don't know if you want to say something on that. It's not really a question, but I guess a comment on some of the points you made earlier in the presentation. No, I think you're right. I think it is, it, there's community initiatives, but they have to be linked as well to work with government, either formalized communities or, I mean, it's, I, was, I don't know if I stressed it explicitly enough, but the community-led or community-based work is a small component which is linked together to get government buy-in and buy-in from service providers if they're there. And it's about the co-production of services and co-production of sanitation facilities rather than purely community-led. And I'm trying to argue that we need, we need community participation, whether it's led or whether it's symbolic, to create services and facilities that will be used Okay, but it, thanks, Jamie. Maybe but I mean, you want to say something? In particular areas where this is a challenge, and people like this approach is not going to work in all towns and cities across the world, and there will be areas where it isn't appropriate. And it's about identifying those as much as it is about identifying other factors. Hmm. So there's another comment question, which I think responds a bit to the questions on your slide as well. Uh, it would be useful to know examples of agents of community behavior change in urban settings. It would be useful to know how urban sanitation data is more routinely captured rather than baseline, midline, endline studies. Uh, a toolkit would be great. I think for a lot of us familiar with the CLTS approach, navigating local service provider authorities is a rather confusing approach. 
it would be great to offer a guide on basic definitions. Basic definitions of service providers. Uh, Laurie, have you got a clarification on that? If so, maybe if you just type it in. Okay, well, we wait for that. Maybe uh, let me just ask one of the other questions. Um, so one of the questions uh, which really brings us to the heart of some of the work in the urban and peri-urban is the question of illegal tenants. So there's a question here saying the main challenge in the peri-urban areas we work in is that most residents are tenants but they're not formally meant to be living there. Are there any good examples of how to deal with this issue? Uh, yes, that is a very complex issue. I, I know in Nakuru they were working with tenants and landlords, and in Uganda as well, Plan International were triggering landlords rather than tenants. However, I, they weren't a legal tenant. I mean, the landlords knew they were living there. But, I mean, it's also about trying to legalize some of these deeds as well. So that goes back to the question earlier about having to work with governments and or landlords or whoever. Well, I guess that was the point that you made about bringing all stakeholders to the table. I mm. think when you were talking also about Mathari in Nairobi, I mean, the case there was that it wasn't just about triggering the communities, but it was really about bringing all the people who were concerned with with the settlement and with urban sanitation together to talk. Yeah, and I mean sometimes the, the communities will often include those landlords. We always assume that landlords are absentee, but in a lot of places, in a lot of towns, landlords actually live on the same plot as the tenants. Were there any other? Yeah, there's an interesting question here. Um, UNICEF Sudan is thinking of using UCLTS to advance urban sanitation in two towns, uh, but embedded in these towns are IDP camps where all the services have been provided for free to date. Is there any experience on CLTS and IDP camps? I'm not sure whether that's specifically an urban question because I think that there is some experience in Pakistan of using CLTS and IDP camps. There's some resources on the website, but I don't know, Jamie, if you've come across other I examples in the I urban I have seen that context. within urban town. I would recommend the last Frontiers we produced was on CLTS in post-emergency situations and in fragile contexts. And there's mentions of IDP camps there, which I recommend mm. you have a read. Okay, so let me just scan. Well, there's a related question to the earlier one about the informal settlements. Um, going back to informal settlements and informality, how might CLTS approaches be implemented in situations of informal settlement redevelopment that either evict existing tenants without alternate housing provision or relocate them? Well, that's quite a big question. I don't know if you have I, any... I think the honest answer is I'm not sure. Hmm. I, I think that's something I'm grappling with at the moment as well. Because you're just... I mean, it's a problem with the cities grow as well and rapid urbanization is that you're pushing people out. You improve sanitation in one area and the poorest move out and then they go back to living in under the same conditions, which I think is a very challenging thing we're all grasping with at the moment. Mm. Um, so this is, we had this earlier question where we weren't quite sure what the uh, what the question referred to, um, 
and there's now a clarification saying, I'd like to better understand who the key stakeholders are traditionally involved in urban sanitation. For example, a stakeholder mapping may teach me what is currently on offer, but I don't know what other services we could engage a local authority to provide. Okay. So some sort of mention of that in a toolkit would be beneficial. Yeah. I think there's a lot of questions here that are probably related to what might be good to include in the toolkit or how to um, how to structure it. There's another question here from Indonesia saying we're starting our first urban CLTS and at the moment we have constraints in time and budget in trying to influence behavior change in the urban community which is quite difficult because it's a one-year project. We incorporate stakeholders engagement and triggering to some extent. What are your suggestions? Uh, I think in a year you're not going to get particularly far. I think perhaps try to work out what your goals are after that year would be my initial suggestion. But I mean getting an ODF community in an urban area is extremely challenging even within a neighborhood. Mm. And I think what this process, reflecting on this work I've been doing, the length of time is great is much greater in the urban environment than in the rural environment and that includes the pre-triggering and getting doing us doing all the analysis you need to do before you trigger the triggering process the process from triggering to open defecation free and the post odf interventions as well all elongate the process hmm. Uh, yeah, like quite a challenging question. I think a lot of this stuff is still not known, so it's it's quite quite hard to give a definitive answer. As Jamie said, there's still it's still early days. Um, I'm just trying to see what other questions. Uh, uh, there's one on the on the issue of space constraints. What would be the best approach since urban areas have high population density? I think we're going to have to accept that shared sanitation is going to be needed and in lots of lots of circumstances it will be one of one it won't just be individual household toilets but how can we I mean we can still get communities involved and get communities discussing where they want toilets to be located like get some sort of buy-in so we ensure use but it's unlikely that in all places there's going to be individual household toilet. Hmm. Unfortunately, that's not recognized as improved sanitation, and, but I don't really see a way around that. So there's two questions here which I think might be related to each other from different people, but one is um, about other strategies and approaches that work synergistically with urban CLTS in enhancing urban sanitation. And then there's another question about sanitation marketing and urban or peri-urban CLTS lessons and best practices. So I wonder if you can maybe talk to that a little bit. Is there any experience of using sanitation marketing in any of those projects that you mentioned on urban CLTS? Yes. I, there's, I mean, the parts on facilitating supply was what I think one might call sanitation marketing and it just varies so much I mean uh, in Mauritania they brought I think Samo Platz they purchased UNICEF purchased a whole load to and brought them to Mauritania so they could be sold off relatively cheaply uh, there's the participatory technology design workshops in the Kuru which is a form of sanitation marketing I suppose and then they did some, in Nepal, they trained some masons to build the toilets. So, I mean, it really varies across the different... It's difficult because although it's all brought under the umbrella of urban CLTS, it's very diverse across the different projects. But mm. there's different interventions. I mean, we could talk about whether sanitation marketing is easier or more difficult in the urban areas. And we can assume that it is easier because it's... Uh, I mean, it's more likely that 
the relevant materials are going to be there. Although at the workshop this was discussed actually, and even outside of the central towns in Africa, also those markets are very underdeveloped and they'll need more sanitation marketing initiatives. Sorry, I'm wondering, I know. <laughs> well, that's quite a big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a few new ones that have come in. Uh, one is about any particular success stories or lessons learned from communities who live near the beach or the sea area. Um, it says because they have huge closet and septic tanks, it's quite difficult for behavior change in this kind of community. If you have a lesson or a success story, can you share what the issues were that triggered the community? I, n I don't really have, I'm not off the top of my head. I know in Madagascar, Fort Dauphin, where Seed Madagascar were working, that is a coastal community. However, I believe that they were mainly dealing with quite basic dirty toilets or people that were practicing open defecation rather than people who had septic tanks. Mm. And uh, there's a question here about how do we bring in the government structure and financing? Well, that's also a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're all quite tricky questions. I think perhaps starting in areas where you know th there is government support and then you can demonstrate how it can work and then you're able to, if I mean if you're successful then you can demonstrate that, you can use that as a case to lobby other governments other local governments but I mean that's a huge challenge and I, I would recommend if you have a few locations that you're able to work in start by picking ones where there is a responsive government and government that is interested in getting involved committed to community-led um, yeah if possible committed to community-led processes and all the same Mm. And then through that, you're building up examples where you can then um, then you can sell it to others. Um, we have a question about enforcing local public health acts. So the question is building on previous submission, um, i.e., one of the earlier questions. What do you think of the effectiveness of enforcing local public health acts through local bodies whilst exploring emphasis on communicating participation on behavioral change aspects? No, I think, that's a, I think that can work. I know uh, in Zambia, UNICEF were doing that. But for that, I mean, you need, you need a bit of a time lag between getting communities engaged and giving them time to take action and then holding them to account on pu the Public Health Act. That Does that make sense? Mm, I think also in Zambia, the Public Health Act, it was uh, in the urban set, in the urban context, it was a lot about um, public places and restaurants and businesses, businesses right? Business, but it was also households, as far as I remember. But the problem with that is also people, uh, municipalities don't have the facilities to enforce the Public Health Act. So if community members are signing up, it's much easier to get communities to put pressure on each other in areas where there isn't necessarily that infrastructure, uh, that uh, public health, uh, that policing infrastructure than bringing outsiders in to do it. Yeah. That, that's, oh, there's another new question that's just come in. Uh, would you recommend starting urban CLTS with peri-urban areas that are slightly more homogenous and growing one and growing one's experience from there? Yes, I think that's a good idea. But I don't, I still, I, I, what I'm trying to emphasize is that it, you can't just do a copy-paste of the rural model. So it still needs adapting to those specific, con, those specific conditions within the peri-urban context. You can't, we, we shouldn't be saying just because it's peri-urban, 
rural CLTS is more likely to work. I'd still stress you need to go through these stages. Mm. And maybe yeah, I really encourage more. people to have a look at your learning learning brief on that that outlines some of the different considerations, and we'll share the link to that um, at the end again. Mm. But yes, it might it might be easier in a peri-urban to do this, but I do wouldn't encourage doing traditional the using the traditional rural model to implement it in peri-urban areas and expect it to be working. Expect it to be successful. Any other questions? I mean, please do continue to email me as well if there's things that you can't think of now. And we are very keen to hear what you'd find useful for your work. I'll put the slide on with my email address and the CLTS email address. So please do, can, we'd love to continue this conversation and hear more from you. Because as I said, we're, design we're considering where we go next. And no, I mean, some of these questions we aren't there yet with. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, Jamie can only answer the questions where there's existing experience. And as we said at the beginning, the experience is still comparatively to rural seal tests rather limited. But um, if you are on the mailing list, you would have received the CLTS newsletter uh, last week or the week before, and that had a whole overview of all that we know on urban CLTS and peri-urban CLTS, including links to useful resources, blogs, videos from different countries, different organizations. If you're not on the mailing list yet, then just please contact us and we'll put you on there and you'll receive the newsletter now so that you've got that summary. And I would also encourage you to have a look on the website where there's a lot of resources on urban and really an overview of what we know so far. So if there's no more questions, we'll give you another few minutes to add questions. So there's a comment, I think, referring back to this thing about the uh, law enforcement saying legal mechanisms might be a way to bring landlords or landowners into the discussion. Yes, and to hold them accountable. Yeah. But often, I mean, as I said, the landlords and landowners vary through different towns and sometimes they can also be just as poor as, well, just a little bit, still be poor and be living on the same compounds within the households. So that they're not always absentee kind of rich people living nicer lives somewhere else, but they're often living in the same communities. Mm. But yes, that is definitely a consideration. Mm. Right. Okay. If you've got any more comments or questions, please add them now. Okay. Yeah, well, as I said, email me, please, and we'll continue to engage. Okay, if there's no more questions, then we'll bring this to a close. Um, there's a question about, is it possible to get a copy of the PowerPoint because someone joined a bit late? Yes, we will circulate the PowerPoint as well as the recording of the webinar, it'll all be up on the CLTS website um, and we'll also post those in the Susanna forum and the LinkedIn, the San, SANCOP forum. Great. Okay, so if you do have other questions that occur to you later or comments or you have some experience to share for which there was no space here, then please do email us on the email address that Jamie's got on his slide there. And yeah, check out the website. Let us know if you didn't get the newsletter, we'll resend it to you. 
and we look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Thanks very much. much for joining today and yeah, hopefully see you at another webinar. Jamie, do you want to say anything more? No, thank you for your questions and I'm going to say it for the third time, but please do let us know what you think. We're always keen to hear what's important and what, what we can do to help support your work.